I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my life living in Nicaragua. I've been getting a lot of questions about relocation, whether it's cost or options or what you need to do recently. It's been a really big week on this. I mean, we always talk about it, but today I have a very specific question from someone who wanted to know about their specific case. And I thought the, the details were just really good and applied to probably a lot of people, especially coming from the United States. So he's a vet, he's got a pension, he's got some savings, and he wants to know how can he afford, where would he go, what would he do? What What does his situation look like? And like, how is he going to deal with healthcare? So we're going to answer his questions as generically as we can so it applies to as many people as possible right after the bump. When I came outside to do the video, I had no idea that it was still raining. It's been raining all morning. I've done multiple videos in the rain today. It's beautiful. I'm loving this. This is my absolute favorite Nicaraguan weather is when you get a light rain and it just cloudy and oh, it's perfect. And the weather, it feels so good out here. Loving this. Okay, so this person sent it in. He didn't say to say who he was. So we're going to keep this anonymous and just some, some generic data. But so we're talking about an American vet, as in not a veterinarian, but a retired armed services uh, personnel. He has an income of roughly $1,500 per month. He may, uh, my understanding is, be able to supplement that just a little bit, but that's a may be able to supplement. So we don't want to count on that, right? If he's able, obviously more is better. Um, he thinks he could supplement, I think, up to about a total of $2,000 a month, uh, so $500 additional. Uh, so not, not a huge amount of variance, but obviously the difference between $1,500 a month and $2,000 a month will be a very big difference in your change of, of lifestyle here in Nicaragua. Those are big numbers. I mean, that's a that's a 33% increase, of course, right? So that would be impactful anywhere, right? Having that much more money. Plus he has savings. He has about 200,000 in savings back in the United States uh, that uh, he mentions in the US bank. And he doesn't wanna to touch that, obviously. That's that's gonna be retirement, that's gonna be important. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna to touch on what to do with that because it's, I think that's important. A lot of people aren't quite sure how to treat that. Uh, because he's a vet, he's on full VA health benefits. And for those who don't know, that means that healthcare is, is in theory, free in the United States. Uh, it's also insanely poor, right? The VA is, is famous the world over. If you've heard that American healthcare is bad, the VA absolutely redefines this. To Americans who even many think America has decent healthcare, uh, when you compare that, even they are like, but the VA, no, 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 that's bad. Um, uh, so obviously there's no VA here in Nicaragua. So if he was to move here, he would be stuck using regular clinics. So that's obviously possible, but if he has anything major happen, he would need to travel back to the United States. He mentions a few places, but it's important just for, for his or anyone who's really looking. If you're gonna travel back to the United States from Nicaragua for healthcare, you're going to go to Miami. Why? Because Miami is where we have direct flights. Not only are they cheap and plentiful, that's important, and not only do they now have extra hops, but it's the one spot that you consistently can go to. Technically, you'd be able to get to Houston as well, much higher cost. There are good hospitals in Houston, but Miami is almost certainly the one spot you would go to just because it is what makes sense. So one of his concerns is, he's got a lot of questions, and, and we're going to get into the, the cost, but uh, he says, of course, we hear about the unstable government, but I question the stability of America's government. Uh, it's the same with crime. You hear about things, but you worry about it in the United States. There's areas of the U.S. Uh, that should have travel advisories. They can be uh, quite dangerous, of course. So let's start with the first thing. Why do we think that Nicaragua has an unstable government? This is not actually a real thing. Unstable is one of those terms that a lot of uh, media outlets and, of course, governments, state departments banter around because it's a meaningless term as far as governments go. Of course, it does actually mean something. A government that's unstable is one that we expect to have problems continuing with governance. But Nicaragua has had a stable government for quite a long time, really long for the region. And so if we're looking at a historic situation, no, there's nothing to indicate that there would be a reason of concern for stability. If we look at it compared to other countries in the region, it's actually a shining example of stability. If we look at the anticipations of things happening with it, it's a very stable government. I know of no indicator that says that Nicaragua has a stability concern. It has no history of stability problems. Of course, if you go back to the U.S. occupation, uh, yes, it has a problem of being invaded by the U.S. in the past. 
That's different than having an unstable government, the same as any place being invaded by a foreign uh, country. The Ukraine does not have an unstable government. It has an invading army trying to take over. And you can agree with either side, but you can't argue that the, that's making Ukraine's government unstable. It's questioning whether you can, Ukraine can remain sovereign. Very different things. You can hypothesize that Nicaragua will have a stability problem in the future based on whatever factor you decide to, you know, apply in your own logic. And as he mentions, the same thing applies to the United States. There's nothing that makes the United States stable. Historically, the United States has a good tradition of being stable. The last period of instability was the U.S. Civil War, which is quite some time ago. So the U.S. has a great track record of stability. But Americans who are looking at it from the inside see the potential for another war or other form of massive instability lingering right around the corner. We don't see that in Nicaragua, at least not on the ground. There's nothing to suggest it. And that the U.S. and Canada tend to promote this vision actually suggests quite a level of stability because they don't point to things that are actual problems. They tend to point to, and this goes for everything that they list from up there, so they list things that are domestic problems and then put them on countries that they think people can't verify. So they know uh, Canada doesn't really have this, but the United States has a very high risk of political instability. So, of course, to distract Americans from that and to leverage the fact that Americans now feel that stability is something to be concerned about, that they will look, uh, hoist it onto other countries. Oh, Americans don't know anything about Nicaragua, so we will accuse Nicaragua of being unstable because it will help distract Americans from the fact that the United States feels unstable. Whether it is stable or not is a different question, but it feels unstable. Americans believe it to be unstable at this point. So it is a thing that America wants to distract Americans from because they want them to have faith in and listen to their government. So that's that's the first piece. We don't actually have an unstable situation here in Nicaragua. We have a very stable situation. So the America fears that because having Nicaragua outstabilize them is an embarrassment to the American government, considering how much pressure they put on Nicaragua to not be stable. The second piece of that is why as an expat, as an American living in the United States or an American living anywhere, I have concerns about the stability of my government. They are my government and I have a right to stability from them or a right to expect stability from them. If they are unstable, it is my rights that may fluctuate. My freedoms may fluctuate. They may not. They could be a good thing, right? Stability itself is not necessarily bad, but it is something that I'm concerned about because it's my government. When I go to another country, in this case Nicaragua, but it doesn't matter, it could be any country, where I am not part of the polity, meaning I'm not a voter, they are not representative governments of me, I don't really care if they're stable. Instability does potentially cause a little bit of concern for businesses who may be looking at an upheaval in business processes or licensing or in some cases permission. Maybe you came in and you're working in a sector like uh, um, rare earth mining and or lithium mining, right? And if the government's unstable, maybe the old government is like, yeah, we want foreign companies to be lithium mining and the new, country, the new uh, government, it, it, uh, when it's truly unstable and you have a new government, they may be like, ah, we, you know, we don't want foreign companies to be lithium mining. We're going to nationalize it. So that's the kind of thing you could become concerned about as a business with stability. But even that is a very minor thing. That is very rare and very specific types of businesses. You're operating a restaurant, a, a tire shop, you know, a web design store. None of the, you don't care about government stability. Like it's it's a point of interest, perhaps, but it's not something to worry about at all. It would never hit your radar to actually worry about. The United States and Canada have a tendency to banter about instability because you can't prove whether a country is stable or not. So there's no way to actually go after someone for false information. And it sounds scary without actually having anything that you have to demonstrate. So you can easily say it to people, hey, that place is unstable. You shouldn't go there. And that sounds scary. But as an expat on the ground, what do I care if a government is stable or unstable? Like, I care only as far as, like, my neighbors. It may affect them. Like, maybe they like the way their life is, and if something changes, that's unfortunate, um, assuming it doesn't change for the better. But for me, as an expat, it doesn't matter what country I'm in or what I'm doing. It just doesn't matter how stable that government is. I'm not part of the polity. So the idea that people mention this at all, I understand why the person writing to me, he's been told by lots of people, you need to be cautious because it's it's unstable. And there's two problems. The first is that they're lying flat out about the stability. That's just a lie. They have no, there's no underlying indicator to push that there could be instability. Of course, any country could become unstable. You just never know. But you don't call stable countries that have nothing happening that would that would put them at stability risk 
unstable. That's pure dishonesty. The second piece is you don't warn people that they need to be cautious based on stability because it is not a factor for which expats are honestly concerned. It is a false concern. So even if the first part was true and Nicaragua was unstable, who cares? It does not impact you as an expat in any meaningful way. So that's really important pieces of just how, just the degree to which people will attempt to dissuade you from finding out how good alternative options are is they will give you this entire uh, false narrative that is not just false as to the facts, but also false as to the concept. I'm going to skip around in his message a little bit. He says, I also have a German Shepherd, which I understand is allowed into the country. Absolutely. I brought my dogs. I know a lot of people who brought their dogs, big dogs, little dogs, bigger than your German Shepherd. Not a problem. Dogs are welcome here. Definitely consider having a yard. One of the reasons I have a fenced yard is that I have dogs and I want to make sure that they cannot get out and that other animals cannot get in. Uh, Nicaraguans do not necessarily watch out for their neighbor's dogs and you really want to make sure that you have some protections for them. Someone recently made a comment on my video that they felt Nicaragua must be an unsafe place compared to Canada because I have to have walls to keep my in my case, dogs in, um, and they ignore the fact that I can keep my doors wide open and don't even have to lock my doors. So uh, who's in the unsafe country now? Okay, so he says, okay, with his budget of uh, 1,500 a month, that's what we have to work with to be, to be sure we're working with a real number uh, and hoping not to tap into his savings. Definitely don't tap into your savings. I agree, bad idea. I'm wondering what, what might be some ideal areas. Uh, not interested, I'm skipping around, but not interested in getting a car, at least not right away, okay with the idea, but not, not a thing he wants. Um, does want to be in, inter in areas with other expats, but not enclaves. He wants not to be isolated, which totally understand. Like, uh, even, even I, who am pretty well integrated, there's a certain amount of, it's nice to be able to get to expats from time to time. Obviously my friends that are expats, I don't want to leave behind, but if I was moving to a new area, I wouldn't want to be completely without expats, not 100%, but, but I'd be okay being nearly, really, really close. Also interested in being able to work remotely, potentially a little bit, that's the extra little bit of money, just a little side job, potentially. I want to be truly realistic. Places like Ecuador, Panama, and El Salvador have been on uh, his radar, but Nicaragua seems most likely, uh, budget and location-wise, um, he's not been to the area. So all of these places are a little bit of unknown. So real quick, I want to address those because uh, it's an interesting list and I would say that these are places I don't generally consider together. Ecuador has a tradition of being a really good expat location. If you were to go back, say, three years and going back, say, maybe 15 to 20 years, it's been an absolutely top pick location to the point where prices are higher. Uh, it's very full of, of expats to quite an extreme degree. Um, and uh, uh, it's on the U.S. dollar, which is what makes it so attractive. But you don't actually want a place on the U.S. dollar under normal circumstances. That carries negatives, some pretty big ones that generally makes things more costly. Ecuador, however, is, when we're talking about stability, it is very unstable. But that alone is, like I said, not a reason to be concerned about Ecuador. What is concerning about Ecuador is that they have um, a high degree of crime at this point, and it's literally quite scary to be there. Um, they, they have some plans. They may do some good things. I don't want to be like, Ecuador's a terrible place. Absolutely not. Ecuador's a wonderful place. And of course, if you're going to live in like the Galapagos Islands, I'm sure you're isolated from all that. But Ecuador is not a place, even my very adventurous South American crew who would be indistinguishable from Ecuadorians to be able to blend in on the street. They will not travel there. They're like, nope, we're stopping the border. Anywhere else in South America, even Venezuela, no problem. Ecuador, absolutely not. So take that from people who live in the region. Yes, obviously Ecuador is a functional country. It is not a collapsed state. Can you go there? For sure. Would I bring my family there at this point? Absolutely not off the table and I'm super adventurous. Uh, so that just, just gauge that. Will it be good in the next few years? Almost certainly. So do you want it on your radar? Maybe, but if you're looking at in some reasonably soon time frame, having some place to move, Ecuador really isn't appropriate for a list with the other places. Now, Panama, also on this list. So I used to live in Panama. I love Panama. It's pretty safe. It's not Nicaragua safe, but it's awfully safe and beautiful country. Lots of great things. It's a lot more expensive than Nicaragua. You can find areas that are much less expensive than the rest of Panama. You're not going to find things more, uh, less expensive than Nicaragua, but you are going to find areas that kind of get close, but it's not going to be the Panama that people talk about. It's going to be a very Central American Panama that's quite far afield from what you're expecting. So 
yes, Panama could be an option. Yes, it's a wonderful country with a lot going for it. Like Ecuador, though, it's on the dollar. That helps make it more expensive. I know that people will tell you it's on the uh, on its own uh, currency, but that currency is locked to the dollar. It's just a reprinting of the dollar. Uh, so it doesn't do what you think it's going to do. And uh, uh, so you're almost certainly looking at an extreme budget challenge to be there. And probably Ecuador as well. Also consider these locations getting to and from the United States tend to be a little bit more pricey just because they're higher cost locations and a little bit farther away. The other one that he's looking at is El Salvador. Now, El Salvador fits better in a list with Nicaragua, uh, but not with the other two. El Salvador is less expensive than those. It is a newly uh, um, secured country, so it's had a track record of being insecure not that long ago. Today, it is extremely stable and secure. Uh, it has um, a little bit higher prices because of that. A lot of people are suddenly looking to flood into El Salvador because they've really gotten themselves in the news which is a little bit unfortunate for Nicaragua, that basically El Salvador is like, yes, we learned from Nicaragua, and after decades of Nicaragua getting it right, we copied them, and now we're, we, you know, we've solved this problem. So the thing that makes, and I don't want to downplay the incredible successes in El Salvador here in Nicaragua, we certainly are super proud of them, they're doing a great job, but they went from being uh, uh, nearly a failed state with the world's highest homicide rate to one of the safest countries in the world practically overnight. And that has caused a lot of social upheaval. It has caused the country to revitalize at an unbelievable pace. And it means that prices are going up, but opportunities are going up. It does have a very bright future. We're very excited to see our neighbor doing so well. They are part of our CA4 group. So we're, we're all in this together, rising tides and all those things. And, uh, you know, Nicaragua and El Salvador are really looking at some tight partnerships because we're such well-aligned countries with high degrees of safety and, and high uh, uh, ease of movement of people both uh, internally and expats into and between the countries. So we really are well-aligned in a lot of ways and, and good partners in the region. So El Salvador is a fantastic choice for this list and absolutely should be on it. Um, really, I would say Honduras and Guatemala make far more sense than Panama or, uh, uh, or, or Ecuador. Um, I realize that uh, if you're looking at things like homicide rates, uh, they're not necessarily the best. Guatemala, very big country. Homicide problems are mostly in isolated regions. Places you would actually spend time in Guatemala are extremely safe. I spend time on the street in Guatemala City regularly, not a problem at all. I don't think twice about going out on the street. Honduras does have a little bit higher crime right now, but they've been knocking it down as well. They're trailing a little bit. They're Right now, they're the, the trailing... Uh, piece of the entire region, but they're doing okay. It's a big improvement. And I think by the time people are really looking to move, it's at least worthy of having on the list. It's low cost like Nicaragua. Uh, it has a lot of uh, similar things, slightly cooler weather, uh, a big area to choose from and very low cost. So it's potentially a decent option, but definitely in Honduras, you need to be a little bit more cautious. Guatemala, you really don't have to be cautious. As long as you're looking at a reasonable place that's either a uh, tourist area or major city or anything like that, you don't have to worry about, is this a safe area or anything like that? It's not, you don't have any instability. You don't have any of that, like, you know, crime on the streets kind of thing. It's isolated, mostly remote regions uh, or really bad barrios. Of course, if you're in Guatemala City, there are bad barrios in a way that there are not in Managua, but that's Nicaragua is just a ridiculously safe place. And El Salvador now even more ridiculously safe. It's ridiculous how much safer they are than an already ridiculous safe place. So those I think are a better short list because they, they have that uh, cost of living similarity across the region. And they're all very close to the United States. They're all very easy to use if you were to have to get back to a VA hospital, for example. Now, before we talk about cost of living and locations, I want to talk about the VA hospital situation. So the VA hospital is notoriously horrific uh, to the point where many people have suggested, and it is often just generally accepted, that the, the overall purpose of the VA is to eliminate high cost people on the American tax roll. That's literally as awful as it sounds. The VA goes dramatically out of their way to withhold medical care or to delay medical care from those who have served our country uh, so that they quickly deteriorate and no longer become a medical burden upon the country. That is literally how Americans often believe the mandate of the VA is, and I know of nothing to suggest it isn't true. Every action, absolutely everything about the VA in the United States is absolutely designed to withhold medical care. That is its function. It is an anti-medical care organization. Uh, it is one built of honestly, abject hatred. And it is a, it is an evil, evil organization. 
does terrible things to the American people and to those who served their country. I'm absolutely appalled by it. So it is a it is in many cases um, American veterans are in a position where they feel they have to use the VA because it is free and it is available to them. And at times they will provide health care, especially if they're able to make you not be costly versus make you be costly. But if you have real issues, be aware. I mean, and and. Every vet is pretty much aware of this, but you really have to think, is the VA really going to protect me? Now, he mentions if he's here in Nicaragua, he's not going to get free medical care, so he's going to have to do something. Well, or he's going to have to use the clinics because he's not getting the free VA care. So Nicaragua does provide free public health care to everyone. And of course, Nicaraguan public health care is vastly superior to the VA system. We generally consider it in many ways superior to the American normal hospital system, but it's certainly better than the VA system. So for many things, you're going to find that just using the clinics here in Nicaragua will suffice and may be actually really good. For many of us, we don't want to be limited. Uh, nearly everyone doesn't want to be limited to the public health system. It is quite good. And here in Leon, we're getting a massive new public hospital that is just set to open. It is the largest hospital complex in all of Central America. It is an amazing achievement for such a small country on such a tight budget. We're so proud of that. And Nueva Segovia is getting one that is clearly not as big, but still really impressive as well in the area of Ocotal in the north. And uh, so, so these are representing major steps forward in the public health system, which is already a really impressive system. That said, many of us still want to use private hospitals in, in many cases for many situations. And uh, things you have to consider is if you were to fly to Miami and deal with the VA for a lot of things, you're probably going to be paying for flights, you're going to be paying for hotels, you're going to be, you're going to be paying for a lot of things. You're going to be depending on an advocate that hopefully will be able to come and advocate for you, will hopefully convince the VA that they want to keep you alive, that hopefully they're going to do what's right for you and that they actually do a good job, right? Very often, even when the VA does kind of try, they screw things up. It's where people who just don't care are sent. Right? It's a great place for doctors that can't do their jobs adequately for the public sector. Now they have a place to go that doesn't care how good of a job that they're doing. So, and, and this is, I, every vet I've ever talked to has the same stories about the VA, right? It is absolutely universal. The VA isn't going to protect you. It isn't going to keep you alive if they can help it. So here in Nicaragua, private healthcare is widely available and very low cost. And you may really want to evaluate at least thinking that the thing you want to do is continue to use health care here, even if the VA is free. And this is quite a statement. Even if there is free health care available to you in the United States, traveling to the United States to use it often won't make sense. We've had major, major medical situations happen here. And the first thing we always say is, thank goodness we're not in the United States. Right? We, we get a quality of care and a cost of care that you can't get in the United States. So even for vets that have access to the VA system, I would seriously recommend taking a hard look at what you would want to do ahead of time so you're not making this decision under a panic scenario. What if you had a heart attack? What if you found you had cancer? What if you have some just really severe thing that's going to be long term and costly and whatever? And, and think about what that budget's going to be and how it's going to affect you using the VA. If you head into the United States, you're gonna be incurring all kinds of living costs that you won't be incurring if you're in Nicaragua. Are those things, in many cases, the cost of living, not the cost of medical care, just the cost of existing in the United States is higher than the cost of maintaining continuous medical care here in Nicaragua. So that's something to consider. Also, if you have a situation that is so dramatic that Nicaragua probably isn't the right place to handle it, you have access to, you could pack up, for example, you could pack up and say, I'm, I'm giving up my home in Nicaragua, at least for now, and I'm moving to where I need to be for the best possible care, which in many cases is going to be Colombia. They have amazing care. Some cases it'll be Cuba, in some it could be Mexico. You have, the world is yours, right? You can go anywhere you need to go, uh, but if you're most likely, you're gonna end up in Colombia, Again, about the same cost as Nicaragua, you can live there and get the absolute best care in the region uh, when needed. It's not that far away. And if, you know, hopefully things get fixed and you're, you're back to health, you can come right back to Nicaragua again. So you have some flexibility. That private health care, yeah, do some evaluation as to cost. Get an idea of what exactly things you're concerned about are likely to, uh, to impact you financially with. But in so many cases, it'll actually be cheaper or at least better overall to take care of it here, actually take care of your health, actually have doctors that want to keep you alive, actually have control of your of your health, get things fixed right away, not wait six months to see if you die and then maybe give you a surgery and then hopefully get it right, right? Do it today, 
get it done, get you back to, to low cost living, get you healthy and give yourself a better life. If you have to, absolutely consider dipping into savings because the long term may save you money. Only if there's healthcare, right? I'm not saying dip into savings if you're not gonna have a problem, and only as a means of ensuring you're able to get the best healthcare. Americans are so used to such an unbelievable degree of corruption. I'm not even talking about the VA, just in the normal American health system is one of the most corrupt entities, let alone healthcare entities on earth. It is so unbelievably terrible that uh, it's often hard for Americans to really internalize just how accessible and affordable, really good, really appropriate healthcare is in other countries. And I think Nicaragua will surprise you. And I think the options in the region will surprise you. And it may be worth just reconsidering whether free VA care actually carries any value for you. My guess is it does not. But it's not my decision to make, but it is my recommendation that you think about it very carefully. It is likely not the scenario that you imagine that it is. Okay, so now his real question. Most of that was just setting up. His real question is, given a budget of $1,500 a month, and wait, let's stop. Before we talk about where you should go, one last thing. With all that money that he has sitting in a U.S. bank account, what I recommend under normal circumstances, put that into a really, really well-established uh, S&P 500 index fund. That is going to give you your most reliable long-term return on that investment. Don't hold it in a bank account. Make sure you're getting a good rate. Make sure it's reinvesting. And if you don't want to put it in retirement, fine. I don't put mine in retirement. If you you know have a specific bank you want to use, fine. I use Vanguard. I, I'm public about that, right? I've been very happy with Vanguard. I put enough in. I've left it long enough. I've moved up to the admiralty level, so we get that extra like half percent or whatever return on everything we do. It's really noticeable. It's one of the best decisions I made in my life. Uh, that it is obviously having kids and getting married. Those were more important decisions. But as financially, this was one of the absolute winners that I did. And thanks to my mother who recommended it when I was very young and just directed me because she was a, a trader uh, for much of much of her adult life. Uh, that works so well, right? That money will roughly double every 10 years. So whether you're looking at it for retirement, you're looking at it as a nest egg, whatever, it's going to keep building. At some point, if you feel you need to tap it, tap only what you need, take out only what you need, put that into some liquidity. So like a money market or, or a normal bank account, so you can spend some money where you have to, and anytime you can put it back, right? Tr treat it as a, as a really delicate savings account that you never want to diminish. And at some point you will hit that point in your life where you, and I don't know what age he is. I, I don't know if I even looked, I'm not sure he said, but at some point you may hit a point where you're like, I have enough money set aside. My $1,500 a month is, you know, I'm living on that. I'm used to that. And now I don't need this nest egg to grow or grow as fast as it, as it is. So maybe you take half of what it generates every month and you take that as as income and let the other half of that keep building or maybe you take all of what it's generating every month and just use that as income and maybe it's generating 500 a month maybe it's a thousand a month right and if you're making 1500 adding a thousand to that will be really noticeable uh for your lifestyle like you'll really notice but hold off as long as you can and that that number will just get bigger and bigger and bigger every month and and nothing's going to outperform that that's reliable so that is my, my recommendation. Definitely avoid any crazy, wild, reckless things like bonds and gold and like speculative weirdness. Stick with tried and true things that actually gain value over time, not things that get speculation up and down over time. That is just general trading advisories. Okay, so that said, we got $1,500 a month to work with. We're going to never touch the rest of that money unless absolute disaster happens. What is the thing to do? So you have a lot of choices. At 1500 you can basically live anywhere in the country. You're going to want to avoid San Juan del Sur for a lot of reasons. He mentioned some reasons that just kind of knock it out anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But at 1500 you're definitely in that range where you'd like to be on the lean side as far as regions. You want to be less expensive. You don't want to go to affluent areas where you're going to pay a premium just for rent. So San Juan del Sur, generally everything just costs more. As some people pointed out, it's not as bad as some people say, but it is more costly, no question. So avoid that. Throughout the rest of the country, you really have a lot of options. Granada, like San Juan del Sur, is going to be a lot more expensive. You're going to have a small premium on restaurants and a high premium on rent. Chances are you're going to want to rule that out as well. Also, an awful lot of expats. Well, enough that, not so much that it's really a problem, but enough that you really notice and you feel like you'll always feel like a tourist. You never really get to integrate very well because there's so many of them. And it's always an us and them kind of feeling there. 
But beyond that, you have a number of cities that still have a number of expats around the country and are going to have low enough rental options and, and dining options that you can do quite well. And you're going to want a city of fair size if you're not going to have a car. Of course, this is Nicaragua. You could get away in a small village without a car. It will work, but you're going to get your best benefit by being in a slightly larger city. So the primary places that I'm going to recommend you look at, and of course, come spend some time, drive around, get a real feel for yourself. You never know what you're going to fall in love with. But the key cities that really make sense for investigation include Esteli in the north, Mountain Town, cooler weather. Matagalpa, also in the north, slightly higher mountain town, a little bit cooler weather, a little bit more difficult for walking around. Personally, my favorite city in the country, very much up in the mountains, the, the home of coffee. Esteli's a little bit more the home of cigars. Both of those are good cooler weather options. Both of them are very low on the expat list. They have expats, but they're very low on it. You're not going to run into very many. Then coming down to the mid cities, you have obviously Granada, but let's rule that out or kind of rule it out. Definitely consider it, but, but low on the list. Masaya and Managua really represent your main towns here. Masaya is a smaller city. It is the cultural heartland of Nicaragua. A lot of expats really like it, but it is primarily Nicaraguans who live there. You don't have the big tourist infrastructure. So you're able to, you know, hang out with other expats when you want, but you're not inundated by them. It also sits just outside Granada, so if you like the stuff in Granada but don't want to live in it, you can be there really quickly. It's on the same bus route. Uh, same thing on the other direction is Managua, the capital. Now, a lot of people rule out Managua, the city of 1.3 million, but it's actually a pretty decent town. It has no tourist attraction, so if you're going to just visit, you're often going to be underwhelmed. But as a place to actually live, it's very affordable, has a lot of interesting little neighborhoods, each full of its own little shopping and pulperias and corner stores and restaurants and bars and it's very easy to get sucked into local life. There are a number of expats that live in Managua. Many choose to live there either because it's closer to the better healthcare options, at least currently that may change, and because Leon is getting such amazing new healthcare options. It's possible that Leon is going to pull ahead of uh, Managua in some areas, but don't hold your breath, but it's definitely going to be closer. Uh, but, but many people choose it for that reason. Many other people choose it for business or if you travel a lot because it's close to the airport. And some people just start in the capital and never look further afield. Other people just avoid the capital because they've heard that it's really boring. And some people have heard that it's dangerous. And of course, it has more danger than most of the other cities in Nicaragua simply because it's a much bigger city and that's where crime is going to be, right? But it's still a very safe city with lots of very safe neighborhoods. It's well worth considering as it has some, some really good prices. And if you're not going to have a car, you have access to basically everything you could possibly want. And people who live there rarely need to leave the city until they're leaving for a vacation. Whereas those of us who live in Leon or people who live in San Juan del Sur, they're going to travel to Managua from time to time just because that's where the Walmart and the Price Mart and things like that are. So certain amounts of shopping are just done there. And it's very doable. It's a small country. It's easy to get around. But living in Managua without a car definitely has its benefits. And you have really good selection of, of uh, night activities, whether it's just going out to listen to live music or going to a comedy club or going to a theater, or going out bowling or going to play laser tag. All those things are in Managua, all, like just everything, plus shopping malls and loads of restaurant options. And it's a foodie culture, so it's a good place for a lot of that. It's just it's just Managua does actually have a lot to offer. It's worth considering, but be aware with dogs, you're gonna want some outdoor space and you will be a lot more limited there. You're a little bit more constrained uh, in the, the lot sizes, but not as much is like in a Tegucigalpa or San Pedro Sula or a, a San Salvador where you have a much denser city. Managua is a relatively sprawling city and has some really beautiful neighborhoods and some very unattractive ones and some problems with litter. So it, it's all going to depend on what you like, but it is well worth considering Managua when you're coming up the road from Messiah. Then hopping over to the west is Leon. Chinandega, you're probably not going to look at, especially if you want to have access to other expats. That is not a good area for that. Leon is the second city of the country and the first city of revolution, as they always like to point out. It is the main exporter of education in the country, has the most vibrant nightlife of per capita of anywhere else in the country. Managua has the most nightlife, but it's the entire city coming into small zones. Leon has the most overall. Leon is a little bit lacking in restaurants. Certainly you can go out to eat, you can do things, but it doesn't have as much food options as a Granada Messiah or Managua, uh, or even a San Juan del Sur, and it's more in line with a Madagalpa or Esteli. 
there's enough, but it's definitely something we complain about. But for nightlife, we're more likely to have nighttime dancing or live music than the other cities. You basically always have something to do. Leon also is the only city that has beaches inside the city zone. So unlike a Managua or Granada, where you could say, well, I want to go to the beach, and that's like a specialty thing. If you live in Leon, going to the beach is part of just going around the city. You can take city buses and treat it much like going to one of the farther out barrios, you really can just go and, and come back and, and just make it a part of everyday life. And in some cases, like tonight, I'm going to run out to the beach for dinner. That's a very normal thing that we do because it's so close. And there's honestly, while there's many fewer restaurants on the beach uh, in Las Penitas and Punta Loya than there are in the city of Leon. Leon is 300,000 and the beach combined. The two is about 7,500, maybe 8,000 people. Obviously, there's many more restaurants in Leon, but it's the same types of food copied over and over again in most cases and often closed. But in the beach area, they're often open and what little uh, number of restaurants there are is often very different. Each one is going to be a unique dining experience. And so when you actually list out all the different types of places that you're going to get in Leon and then compare it to the beach, it's surprisingly close. It's often just easier to go out to eat on the beach. Uh, so that's an important thing to add into the, the kind of Leon zone. It's far enough out that you don't get delivery from the beach to the city, but it's close enough that you can just ride the bus and use it as part of your experience. Leon is big enough. All of these cities are big enough that you'll have no problem dealing with public transportation, which could be buses, could be rutas, which are like the pickup trucks. You kind of hop in the back uh, using taxis to get around um, or anything else. And of course, they're very walkable for the most part. These are very, very safe cities. Managua is an exception, not in that it's not safe, but that it is not a walkable city. You might walk your neighborhood, but you're not going to walk to different parts of the city. They are too far away. But in the other cities, all of the other cities, you can walk everywhere in the city. If you live in the city, you can walk to anything, and that can be important. So when someone's like, oh, I'm going to meet you across town, you're like, okay, that's what, a 30-minute walk? Could, right? It's a completely different experience than a lot of other places. Leon has a pretty good expat community. It is not really large. It's not like Granada or San Juan de los Sur, where you're going to think of it as an enclave in any way, shape, or form. But it does have a large enough expat community that it is very common to run into people when you're out at restaurants, especially more affluent restaurants like Sua, for example, a Spanish slash uh, Peruvian Mediterranean style restaurant here in the city. They're quite popular, a little bit more expensive, and you often see expats there or tourists who are passing through. So that type of thing, you're, you're just going to run into all the time. But if you went to like a Chinandega, you may never see an expat. You could go months and months without ever even seeing one on the sidewalk anywhere and, and having no idea where they are because there's so few. All the cities that I mentioned have enough expats that you would have people to meet with. But Leon, Managua, and Masaya definitely have enough that you could easily have groups that you hang out with on a regular basis and choose different groups based on your personality rather than being stuck with just the ones that happen to be there. In Leon, there's a lot more expats on the beach than there are in the city, but there's definitely a number downtown in the city. As you get into any of the barrios, like where I am, they drop to the point where I know that other expats exist in my barrio, but I've only met one of them in my direct region and met one more quite some distance away, uh, maybe a 20, 30 minute walk, about a mile away uh, from here and, and only one time. So not, not people that you run into regularly, uh, but they do exist. So when you get out into the barrios, it's very easy to be part of a, a local community, uh, but easy to go into the center, out to the beach when you wanna run into expats uh, more naturally. Managua, you're gonna have to seek them out a little bit more because there's just such a larger population and people are kind of sprinkled all over. Messiah, I think you'll find them a little bit more concentrated. At the budget that you have, you're really looking at a lot of different options for housing. You could be in a gated community. That's completely viable. Um, you're going to be looking at uh, long-term unfurnished rentals. So your biggest cost is going to be putting in those initial uh, investment into, you know, a refrigerator, uh, an oven, uh, television, those kinds of things. Once you've done that, you can move around, just take them with you. It's really cheap to have a truck and maybe a crew drive it to your new place and set up. So you'll get much cheaper rentals uh, at the, at the price point that you are, you're probably going to be looking at somewhere between 200 and 300 per month for a two bedroom, if assuming it's just you. And uh, that will probably be 
adequate. It'll mostly here in Nicaragua, the, the trend is to have a small house rather than an apartment that's officially an apartment, but that's not 100% the case. I have a beautiful apartment uh, in another part of the city that's very similar to, uh, it, in the inside, you wouldn't know you weren't in a house, but it's actually an attached apartment, two bedroom, one bath, plenty of space, nothing special, nothing fancy, very comfortable, easy to air condition, easy to open up the windows and just let fresh air blow through, little backyard, people hang their clothes to dry here, uh, those kinds of things are things to look for. You could, in most of the cities, go for a traditional city house. Here in Leon, the colonials get pretty expensive just because they're classic and, and they're hundreds of years old. But once you're outside of that, anything that's a barrio house or a city house in Managua is going to be very, very affordable. But there's a real chance you're not going to really like those. As is in any country, there's going to be the lowest uh, cost housing options. are going to be less desirable. But all over the place, there's going to be some hidden apartments here and there. And there's going to be what are the tr new traditional Nicaraguan style houses that are building in communities all over the place and you can get them like here in Leon where they're ungated and you can get them in like Managua where they are gated and in Managua I would say even as far as Ciudad Sandino there's some amazing options that's an up-and-coming region where the prices are still low people are still wary of it but it's a gentrifying neighborhood so it's a great time to get in a lot of new bars and restaurants opening a lot of opportunities and really easy to get into Managua when you want to do that and not hard at all to hop one of the buses going out to Leon if you want to add the Leon zone as well because it sits on the road going to Leon those are really the places I would look at most seriously. And if it was me, while I love Matagalpa, it's probably my favorite city, uh, I would most likely look at Leon and Managua as the most likely places they're going to best meet your needs, where Managua includes Ciudad Sandino. Uh, but a lot of it's going to come down at that point. They're going to be so close in price. They're going to be so close in options. It's going to come down to which places just just ring right with you, right? Spend a little bit of time in each one and one you're going to say, I don't, I don't like the looks of this neighborhood. And the next one you're going to go, I just, I just like this. I want to walk out to this every morning. That's where you're going to want to be. Uh, for me, if I was going into any of these places, I'd probably want to look at one of the gated communities. There's just a lot of convenience to that. You don't have to worry about things in your yard walking off. Safety isn't really your concern. It's that you leave something outside and it disappears. You know, even just, oh, I left a plastic chair, a potted plant. I don't want to have to worry about them. I don't have to bring them in at night. I, you know, and those are the kinds of things we worry about here is this really petty crime where people just see an opportunity and they grab something. The chances that something dangerous is going to happen, extremely low. Could happen. It's not 100% safe. Nowhere is. It's not quite Canada, although we're hearing that it might be. Uh, it's not quite El Salvador. But it's very, very, very safe. Safer than the United States on average. So these, these petty crimes are the things we actually worry about. So a little bit of protection for that. Plus a lot of those gated communities are just next to nice restaurants. You tend to attract, right, the kind of things you want to have. Have neighbors that you can go talk to. Neighbors you feel really comfortable talking to because they're also in the gated community with you. If you're in the cities, your neighbors could be wildly different positions than you, uh, which is fine. Like you get to integrate really well, but you just, you just don't know what your neighbors are going to be like and they can change wildly. But if you're in a gated community, there's a lot more just stability to like the kind of neighborhood that you're going to be in and what your neighbors are going to be like. I've spent a lot of time in some gated communities and even some very low cost ones. Rents in the 200 to $215 per month range. On, on smaller places, sure, the big ones are going to be like 300, 350. And you know what the facade's like, what amenities are like, are going to vary a little bit. But at just over 200 with room to park a car, room to barbecue in the backyard, not a lot, but enough to have a grill, enough to set up a little table, enough to do a little bit. A space for your dog to run, you're going to want to make sure you're finding a place for that that can be a little bit tough but the gated communities again a lot of them have their dogs just running outside if your dog's dog friendly that may work out great that they can kind of run around the neighborhood but you know they're inside a contained area they're not on a road where traffic's going to be coming by so a lot of things to consider uh those are ways that i would probably lean uh if i was working with that budget and coming to nicaragua at least as a starting point remember you could easily move into a Ciudad Sandino, someplace that's very middle of the road. You're going to have low price and uh, good options, close to things, but not in the midst of things. And just take a year. Then you can explore Managua, explore Leon, explore Matagalpa, make some decisions and say, well, I think I want to try this other thing out and just look for a good deal. And when you get it, move. And, and the cost of moving will be very minimal. Uh, so hopefully you won't have to, you know, dip into savings or have a major budgetary change. And you may find places that just cost less. Maybe you decide you want to be in the country or in a suburb or in a small city like Nagarote. All those things are options, but they're very difficult for when you first start out. I've been here for a number of years, moving to a country house or a very tiny village. No problem at all. Wouldn't, wouldn't even occur to me to be potentially difficult. But if you don't have a car and you don't speak Spanish and you don't have friends here, it'll be a lot more difficult. So being in like a gated community where a lot of things are handled for you and not speaking Spanish, 
will be far, far easier. If you, you could find one that has other expats, but likely you want to find one that has at most one or two and really is Nicaraguans, that's where you're going to get your value. If you've got expats, you're going to pay a much higher price for getting basically the same thing. Uh, so look for the non-expat areas that isn't advertising to expats in any way whatsoever. That's going to be your best deals for sure. Thanks for joining me like and subscribe. Uh, just a reminder, because he did ask about this as well. We do not provide relocation services. I love making these videos and providing information about relocation, uh, about moving to Nicaragua, about travel in Nicaragua. At most, if you're looking for a one-on-one -on -one consultation, I'm happy to do phone calls uh, or something like that, Skype calls or, or whatever people do these days, WhatsApp calls. And Nika Abla, and uh, um, under certain conditions, we'll do uh, private tours. That's that. That is it. We don't offer anything with real estate. We don't offer anything as a formal relocation package. We're not providing a bunch of services. It's not something we do. We're very passionate about informing you, and we're going to come up with a video very soon that talks about what you need to know to relocate because you don't need those things, right? I would not be doing you a good service if I charged you a whole bunch of money to provide a relocation service for a lot of reasons. So we're going to provide a tool set video uh, that really covers like how to move to Nicaragua because we have so many new people interested in relocation just popping up right now especially and we want to make sure that you are well equipped to do so and you know what to do what not to do uh, and you just have one video that you can reference over and over again and be like here's the set of things we're good to go I feel confident and if you need to absolutely I'm happy to do a one-on-one -on -one phone call for an hour or whatever and talk through your ideas make sure you're on the right page answer specific questions that apply just to you whatever absolutely happy to do so if you'd like to support the channel you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, please share on social media. Tell someone about the show. And you guys are doing this. Thank you so much. So many people have been joining the channel. So many more just eyeballs are on this. This is such a, a wonderful topic. It's such a great interaction and community that we have. And for those who are new, Thursday nights, we generally do a live stream. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure we do that. Into in in Is that today? It might be today or tomorrow. I don't even know what day it is. Uh, that will be coming up. And uh, we try to do that. Uh, on Thursday evenings and it's uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a chance for you to ask questions in real time and we can just you can type and say here well, this is my question and I can talk to you so I'd love doing that please hop on that as well and uh, ask your questions below always just scroll down ask your questions I really love uh, being able to answer stuff for people and I will see all of you tomorrow and you can support the show right now in a very real way. When one of these videos pops up on the screen, choose one, preferably the longest one, and click on it. You don't even have to watch it. Let it play in the background. That's okay, too. But if you want to comment on it, even better. Have a good day.